Well, thank you so much, uh, Ian and Martha, for the introduction and and uh, the generous offer to, uh, to allow me to talk to you today. And also, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Royal Society who sponsored this, especially the, uh, the Atlantic Chapter, which was founded in 2008 to promote Royal Society activities here uh, with a generous uh, gift um, for Mrs. Irving. Sandra and Arthur Irving, excuse me, but we really do appreciate their interest and all of your interest in, in promoting science and scholarship and knowledge and sharing it with the public. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, Oop. starting with this, this formal thanks <clears throat> to the sponsors of this event. And I like to see these all together because each organization here has a real commitment to sharing knowledge and development with the public. And I like them all, and I like what they do. And it's really nice to see them joining together to sponsor this. And I also just want to show this and thank, these are just a few, well, it's a lot, but these are some of the sponsors of the science that Martha talked about. And you'll see Nova Scotia companies, you'll see government agencies, you'll see other companies, you'll see federal funding agencies. Uh, this tells you some of the diversity of <clears throat> who paid for all this stuff, because I've had a great time doing science, and there's been some benefit of it, but somebody paid for all of it, and I certainly appreciate it, and I appreciate the diversity in that backing. So now we're going to start talking about, ah, I can't see this thing. What do scientists do? So this is for the general public, and I know that some of you don't really know what scientists do. My mother wasn't so good at that. She knew I had to be doing good things, but when she came and visited my lab when I was a student, I showed her all this fancy equipment, took her through the whole lab, was showing her our emission spectrometer. Finally, she said, do you have a Bunsen burner? Because <laughs> she knew what that was. So what do scientists do? Well, what scientists do is they explore. Can you see that well enough, or is the light too bright? OK, good. Scientists explore. They've been exploring for a long time. Here's the Challenger expedition in the 19th century. Tremendous search for knowledge. Here's Marianne White, fellow of the Royal Society from Dalhousie. You'll be hearing from her sometime doing material science, but once again looking for many sustainable solutions to important problems, but exploring how things work. The human genome. Tremendous search that was successful, and look what we're getting out of that. And this animation here, those colors that are swirling around, is a numerical simulation of ecosystems developing, ecosystems of plankton in the ocean, the global ocean, as they're influenced by circulation and time. It's just an unbelievably uh, amazing accomplishment looking at the ecology of the oceans from Mick Follows and his colleagues at MIT. Now, <clears throat> how does this exploration work? What is exploration science? What are scientists doing? Well, here's one process that is common. It has not, every study is not the same, of course, but it's a common trajectory here. Observe. Observe nature. Observe something. Usually, in science now, we use new tools to observe it so we can see things we couldn't see before. Ocean observation systems, for example. With these observations, it's inevitable. We discover new things. As our observation capabilities advance, we discover. What we discover, we describe, of course. What we describe, we want to explain better. How do we explain it? We experiment. And we predict. We compare our predictions with what we observe. And then we come up with explanations. This is basic scientific process. This is ex exploration, discovery. The results of all these things, at a minimum, are three big results. Evidence, knowledge, and technology. Okay, These observations and descriptions, this is evidence. It's telling us what the world is like. The knowledge we've developed is telling us how the world works, but in the process, 
guaranteed we are developing technology and as I'll show you today uh, there are many applications of this technology above and beyond using advanced capabilities to do more of this discovery. So here's the product. What do we do with it? <clears throat> we do lots of things with it. These are just examples. Environmental stewardship, industrial innovation, economic development, management of risk. These are laudable goals. These are how we justify getting paid to do what we do. But I think you know that science does this. It's really important. So, end of story. Now, can we depend on a trickle down from scientists exploring and just figuring things out and these things that we as society, as a global community need? And uh, the answer is basically, we better give it some help. And the question is, how do we as society, anyone who's concerned, can we look at ways so the needs influence the research agenda? So I think there's no question we want to do that. We know governments do this now. It's imperative we do this. We want to make these connections. But let's talk about how this might be um, implemented. So where do we start? Where does science meet industry? Air Canada sitting in the seat, flying between meetings. Happens to me all the time. I'm sitting next to someone, someone from the real world, someone who's not a scientist, someone from industry. I'm sitting in my seat next to a guy from Quebec somewhere who looks like a young entrepreneurial type, and I'm doing in-flight entertainment. I see you don't know what scientists are like, except you scientists. This is my in-flight entertainment. I've got my laptop open, and these are graphs of ocean properties from our ocean gliders off the coast of Nova Scotia, measuring temperature, salinity, phytoplankton distributions, and I'm looking at how these relationships change. I'm just having a ball looking at this stuff. And so the guy says, what are you doing? And I show him this. And of course, what he says is, what's the use of that? And this is a really important theme. What is the use of this? You know, because what I'm doing is I'm looking at how the ocean works. <clears throat> and the use of it is this is exploration. And exploration is the foundation of environmental science. Okay? This is a tremendous tool for exploration and understanding how the ocean works. What we are looking at is a compiled set of satellite images of primary productivity in the ocean. What that is, the growth of phytoplankton. Phytoplankton, a single-celled, microscopic plant life in the ocean that provides the food for food webs. It's very important in chemical cycling. This is the ocean. This is the world breathing. These are the dynamics. These are the places. The hot spots are just what you think they are, where the rates of productivity, the plant growth is high, the blue spots are where it's low. These highs and lows and, and the changes with the seasons are related to light, climate, weather, temperature. And we look at these things and we try to explain how they work. And this is the foundation of these models that you hear about, IPCC, all these things. But we try to understand how the oceans change with climate change. We want to see effects of fisheries, pollution. We try to develop quantitative descriptions of how the ocean works. But basically what we're doing is exploring and describing and explaining. So this kind of thing has gone on for a long time. I want to go back to the 50s through 80s, because this was a golden era of exploration. I'm talking specifically now about plankton ecology, okay, food webs of the surface layers of the ocean. The golden era, or a golden era, was the 50s to 80s. And what went on then was first in the United States, and there was a strong history going up to then in the UK and in Europe, but the United States, the Atomic Energy Commission of all people, funded 
with long-term stable funding, a group at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and one at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and their mandate was to study food chains or food webs. That was their mandate. And they hired people, they set up these groups, and the people they set up worked for years and years and established the foundations of our fields. Uh, 50 years ago, the Bedford Institute of Oceanography, the Marine Ecology Laboratory was set up. Trevor Platt ran that for a number of years. Their mandate, understand ecological processes of the plankton. This was a wildly successful model, wildly successful. And I'll explain part of the reason why, but first just show you a general example of the kinds of things these people did. These are just titles of papers. Just pick one or two and look at them. But what they are basically fundamental contributions to our understanding of how the ocean works. Fundamental papers, just plain what people would call basic science. The people above are the people who have basically laid the foundations for what we know now. I want to take just a quick pause here. You may have noticed a bunch of guys. And I just want you to know that the demographics of oceanography has changed dramatically in the last 50 years, and we're uh, getting to in much, much better shape here. So it's a good thing. OK, back to that guy with a beard, though. So John Strickland, who was recruited from Canada to work in California at the Food Chain Research Group, back in the 60s, they applied some very advanced tools for the time to look at things such as the distributions of phytoplankton with depth. So it was a very advanced tool at the time as pumping water through a hose through a machine, but the point was they were able to get, develop a technology to observe things that had never been seen before because they used new tools. They could see these little layers of phytoplankton and they were measuring the nutrient concentration in the water also in the stream. These were big advances. It's just an example of the kind of thing that they were doing within their mandate which was to observe and describe the ocean. Yeah, that's my introduction about foundations of exploration. What I'm going to do now is tell you three stories about science. This is the first story, which is from exploration to, to innovation and commercial success. And I'm gonna to talk to you or trace a story that goes back to John Strickland and the Food Chain Research Group, goes right through the Lunenburg County Obser Lunenburg, <laughs> uh, Observatory, my partnership with Satlantic, and commercial success for Canadian ocean industry. Okay, so let's go to story number one. So it starts in 1975. That's when I, that was my first year as a graduate student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. I was working for Richard W. Epley, a uh, great oceanographer, studied phytoplankton. That was about the definition of what I did. These are phytoplankton that look really nice. You shine blue light on phytoplankton, they glow red. It's called fluorescence. This is the machine you use to measure fluorescence. If you pump water through that machine <clears throat> with a hose, <clears throat> you can measure the distributions of phytoplankton. So I was there studying hard, taking my classes. <clears throat> A couple of years later, there's Dick. What's he doing? To me, it's obvious because I know him. he's thinking. Back in the day, you could think, and he thought. And he was just thinking about stuff. There was something else you could do back then. I was a graduate student, and a visiting scientist from Norway came by, an algal physiologist. He said, I just read this paper from these Swedish people, and they have this technique, and you can measure how healthy phytoplankton are just by making the simple manipulation measurement fluorescence. And we said, cool, that's really great. And I said, hey, Dick, I'd like to work on that. He said, okay. It wasn't part of my thesis. He just says, okay, why don't you do that? Like, Something like that. I know I ended up doing it, and he gave me support to do it, and we did it, and we published this paper. We made the measurements. We did this kind of manipulation with chlorophyll fluorescence. And we published this paper, which is the first continuous measurements of this fluorescence response index in the open ocean. What this is is a simple measurement using 
this process of chlorophyll fluorescence that actually gives us an indication of the physiological status of phytoplankton and something about their photosynthesis. So we put, this is the first continuous measurements. And the second one were from Louis Lejeune, who got his PhD at Dalhousie. We published the paper, and our summary of the, of the conclusions was, well, <laughs> We may not know exactly what we're measuring, but the patterns observed are too strong to ignore. That's peer-reviewed conclusion, because it was true. But, oops. And uh, one might say, well, what's the use of that? Well, I'll tell you, it, with the benefit of retrospect, it worked out. OK, this index thing, it was based in plant physiology, the real Scientists have been looking at that for years. But it went into the ocean realm. Other scientists refined the method. They developed instruments. They measured it all over the world. They refined the interpretations, yada, yada, yada. This is now a standard method, the most advanced way to look at phytoplankton physiology in the ocean. Instruments are made by different companies. Satlantic here in Halifax makes one of the best. There's Jeff McIntyre director of marketing for the parent company who also got his MSc degree in our lab studying how little algae swim. Okay. Now, that avenue of research, looking at fluorescence, an optical property of phytoplankton, something you can get information by just shining light on water and measuring the light that comes off, it's an optical measurement. And there's lots of things you can do with the ocean by just looking what happens to light in the ocean. And we follow that theme ever since. Optical instruments, algal physiology. And what emerged from that over a couple of decades with a lot of labs in different places in the world was the emergence of a field that did not exist in 1988, in 1980 called bio-optical oceanography. Biology, optics, oceanography. That is now a central, it's a cornerstone of oceanography now. It's a cornerstone of remote sensing, ocean observation systems, harmful algal blooms. It is cornerstone. And it was developed over these years. And it had a long way to go. And it was only part way along in the 90s when Marlon Lewis and Satlantic and Dalhousie University supported my nomination along with Alec Hay, who does acoustics for what's called an industrial research chair in environmental observation technology and Cirque Satlantic Dalhousie. And this was a win-win-win partnership. Okay. The company gets to work with the scientists doing frontline research. The scientist gets access to cutting edge technology and actually gets to develop, with the, develop it with them. The university gets faculty member access to this cutting edge technology and of course the students win because they get to work in a research program that is doing the best kind of stuff around. And what did we do? Among other things, <clears throat> We established, along with other colleagues at Dow, the Center for Marine Environmental Prediction. And this was an idea or an organization or whatever it was that was designed to foster cooperation between university, government, and industry. So we had companies, we had fisheries and oceans, we had Environment Canada, defense research. It was a big tent where we could all work together. People in this room know how well it worked. We got together because we had common interests. We could also apply our science, pursue our explorations, but also do some things that were really, really practical about observing the ocean, predicting, et cetera. So it was pretty successful. Uh, we had international meeting, edited a book, established the Lunenburg Observatory with Martha talked about. It was conceived in 1997, first deployed in 2002. I believe we were one of the only ocean observatories in the world. It was an ocean weather system where we made measurements in the water, in the atmosphere. We had the most refined 
a meteorological model from Environment Canada. We developed the ocean models. They were all run by the measurements as they went right into the computers, right? So it was a real-time observation and prediction system that even included biology. This was one of the only ones in the world at the time. It was fully integrated by 2007, and it was dismantled in 2008. Our funding was from the Canadian, uh, what's that called there? Foundation for Climate and Atmospheric Sciences, and their mandate was not renewed, and we were one of the first victims of that. Okay, the technology of this ocean observation business and optical instruments still continues to develop, and one of the big changes and developments, it's being deployed on different instrument platforms. And now this is our technical team here, trained through this CMEP and other things. Richard Davis has been with me forever. Ocean gliders traversing the Nova Scotia shelf, measuring different properties. These technologies still exist right now. You can go on the web and get the measurements. It's right out there right now, Richard. Right now. Okay. So this was real technological. These were observations, very practical. We were doing predictions, et cetera, et cetera. And this was in the context of a research chair that I had for 15 years with Satlantic, supported by government and industry. It was great for them. It was great for me. But something I want to make abundantly clear is all along, exploration was part of the program. All along. So we had practical things that we had committed to do. There were some immediate needs of industry and, and uh, our commitments for observations. But all along, we and the students and the collaborators were doing this fundamental stuff because we were allowed to. It was recognized. It was important. And this was a hugely important complement to the research program. And it didn't hurt. On the commercial side, there was commercial success in ocean instrumentation. Uh, there's Atlantic personnel working in Halifax today. This is some of the equipment. They're, they're part of now of a, a bigger coordinated corporate structure that is the world leading ocean instrumentation <coughs> company, period. Okay? Good. Oop. So, CMEP came and it went, but the research, the vibrant research programs have not changed at all. Dalhousie has a very, very, very strong ocean research partnerships, and these are all partnerships very highly integrated with many different themes, the marine, environmental, observation, prediction, and response network, a big network, the ocean tracking network, the Canada Excellence Research Chair network with Doug Wallace, ton of activity going on, interactions with many different sectors. But you know what? And I know that there are concerns out there about big investments in these big programs, but I want to direct you to information straight from the web page. These big research enterprises still allow, or at least they can, still allow a fundamental commitment to exploration but it also has societal value. So the main research themes, observe, understand, predict. Does that sound familiar? Okay, that's science story one. It's kind of almost linear from exploration to commercial development, societal value, et cetera. Here's science story two, which is science and environmental security. And Martha mentioned this about the ozone hole. It's the ozone hole story. And if there's any scientific success story about environmental security and science that I can relate, relate to you, I think ozone depletion fits the model because we know what happened there. Just to remind you, <coughs> research in ozone depletion developed very strongly around the world in response to a recognized environmental threat. The depletion of ozone was observed. There were preliminary explanations of what was going on. The observation of the ozone hole was a surprise, and they realized it was even worse than they thought. Scientists around the world marshaled their efforts with support from their governments and studied it. 
Canada studied it, the US, around the world they studied it. We worked on it, and as Martha said, we did some highly technical research trying to come up with an understanding and quantification of how damaging the different wavelengths of sunlight, of solar radiation were to phytoplankton. We needed this quantitative information to understand and describe what the effects of ozone depletion would be on phytoplankton. We did the work, published it in Science and Nature. It was pretty cool. I, it, it stood the test of time. The results, incomprehensible to the general public. And this brings up a really important theme. A lot of the science that goes on has a bearing on many issues of, of broad interest, but in order for that science to get to the public, the scientists have to talk to the public through the media. The scientists have to get translated. Now it's our job to talk as, clear as, we, as clearly as we can. I'm trying to do that now, but nonetheless, the conduit from this technical stuff, there has to be the opportunity, like I'm having today, for the scientists who do this work to explain to you what it really means. Okay. And of course, in the ozone issue, <clears throat> this was done. I think this mechanism is kind of familiar to, not, to you now. They had international panel and they made periodic assessments and they published the assessments. They said this is the state of the science, this is what we know about ozone depletion. They came out every several years, okay, this is just one example. And you know what happened back then? Some of you may remember, I will remind you, there was backlash, there were deniers, there were books published, there were scientists like Fred Singer one of the biggest critics of climate change science. He was one of the biggest critics of ozone science. He was a critic of tobacco science. Okay. Rush Limbaugh, Dixie Lee Ray, a scientist, she studied shipworms, but she wrote a book about ozone depletion. But it's important. There was strong pushback from industry, constant attacks, and the arguments were kind of familiar. The scientists are in it to beef up their research budgets, to go traveling, it's all for natural causes, and they said all this stuff. In fact, the arguments were as old as the hills, except the example I'm using with the term old as the hills comes from last week in the paper. You remember this one? You just got a response to it this morning. Yeah. So this <clears throat> letter to the editor talks about the eco-alarmism being old as the hills, and the arguments that are in this letter are not at all uncommon. They are completely comparable to the skepticism about ozone science. So those are as old as the hills as well. But what I can tell you with confidence, and scientists don't usually tell you things for sure, what I can tell you is the scientists were right. And you know what? Industry did okay. The chemical manufacturers were right in there in the ozone controversy, swinging. And things quieted down considerably when they developed the replacements for CFCs that we now use today. Okay, so that's story number two is an example. Science provided what the world needed. Evidence, knowledge, technology, and this particular thing, management of risk. You know, if scientists hadn't weighed in on this ozone depletion thing, I think you can appreciate the situation would be different today. Which brings me to emphasize again that science backed by evidence has a proven track record. We can go back to previous controversies. Phosphate detergents, the experimental lakes, 
there were people who fought tooth and nail against the notion that detergents were polluting our lakes, the experimental lakes. David Schindler's leadership did an experiment. This is a, a lake that's partitioned, showing absolutely clearly that phosphorus was responsible for the eutrophication. The Royal Society of Canada, the Council of Canadian Academies, they published scientific reports that you can trust. The American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, the Union of Concerned Scientists, they have summaries that are based on this kind of a foundation that I've been talking to you about, and it is peer reviewed, and believe me, as one who's done a lot of peer reviewing, it's not perfect, but it is a lot better than either putting thumbs up and thumbs down on a little comment section on a web page. Now, industry driven research, the science story three. So now we're thinking about these scientists out there, this research agenda. But we know industry has needs. There's things they want to do. I've already shown you there's already wonderful examples of cooperation with industry. But what happens when industry really needs something? So I'm going to talk about industry-driven research and give you an example. This is ballast water problem. I think a lot of you appreciate <coughs> the issue having to do with ship traffic and ballast water. So the ships pick up their ballast water in one place keep themselves trimmed properly going across the ocean. They leave their ballast water somewhere else and it has organisms in it. And those organisms cause trouble, coastal ship traffic, potential vector for harmful algal blooms in Canada, an example. This problem is very well recognized, has been well recognized, and the world is doing something about it. The solution is treating the ballast water, doing something to that water so those things, those organisms that were in there, don't get out and invade somewhere else. So you've got to disinfect or somehow or other inactivate or remove those potentially invasive organisms. Ballast water treatment is the solution. <clears throat> Both the International Maritime Organization and the United States Coast Guard are developing and implementing regulations and the bottom line is when these things are fully implemented, shipping traffic will have to have treatment systems that are effective so that we will be protecting our coastal environments from invasive species. This picture is from Canadian company, Trojan, Marinex, who has systems that clean water. Now, so we have Canadian technology, by the way, Trojan, uh, does the UV disinfection or, uh, of New York City's drinking water. Pretty big gig. Pretty competent technology. The ballast water treatment is different. Let's look. Those shipping routes in the world gives you a little bit of an idea that there are a lot of ships and there's a big market and there's a Canadian technology of using ultraviolet radiation to knock these potentially invasive organisms out. But there's a scientific problem. And here's the scientific problem. <coughs> These are phytoplankton, not very big. One twentieth of a millimeter, they're not very big. So we're looking at them under a microscope. And you see a whole bunch of those little guys. And some of them are pretty lively and some of them aren't. How do I know that? Because if you add a stain, a special stain to that sample, the live ones are supposed to glow green and the dead ones look like little duds. So according to this picture, those green ones are alive and the ones that aren't green are dead. And the Coast Guard says, if you want to prove that your system works, you've got to prove they're dead. And here's the problem. The technology to say whether these things are alive or dead uses the stains. Woo, get my punchline. UV ultraviolet radiation doesn't exactly kill things. It destroys or messes up their DNA so badly that they can't reproduce. So they can still swim around maybe, 
They can still look pretty good. They can still pass the test for being alive, but they can't reproduce. Therefore, they can't invade a coastal environment. Therefore, they're not viable, but they're not dead. They are zombies. <laughs> and that's a problem. Because if <clears throat> the test for the effectiveness of your UV treatment system says your organisms are alive and can invade this environment and flunk the test when you know darn well that they can't reproduce and they can't invade that environment. You've got a scientific problem. Oop, I lost some text, I'm sorry. I didn't have the answer there. What's the resolution? Oh good, in fact, look, I'm a teacher, right? So I'm gonna ask you folks, what's the resolution? where the text isn't there. The resolution is rigorous scientific evaluation backed up by a partnership between industry and university. In other words, we've got to study that problem of ultraviolet treatment of algae and <clears throat> the extent to which it kills them and the extent to which it shows up on these stains because this is a major question in regulation of a multi-billion dollar industry. So the answer is, do the rigorous science. And the way you do the rigorous science is you get together in another one of these partnerships. In this case, the question that drove it all came straight from industry. Okay? This graph here is just a picture of what we do, which is rigorous measurements of how many phytoplankton survive the treatment with ultraviolet radiation at different doses, and at the same time, a quantitative assessment of how they look when you check them out with the dyes. Boy, you're getting my punchlines too early. Okay. Now, here's the interesting thing about our scientific response to the industrial need. And that is, the roots of the solution are in the science of how things work. The science that we had to apply and are applying now to this research question come from our research on harmful algal blooms and optical detection. We're using fluorescence techniques that come from Going back to 1977, when Dick Epley said it's okay for you to study that. We're working with ultraviolet radiation. So we're relying on research we did that was funded to look at the effects of ozone hole. We're doing basic science. Uh, Hugh McIntyre, by the way, is doing all this work. He's up in the corner with me. Uh, we've spent much of our careers trying to describe very clearly the way you grow phytoplankton to do proper experimental work. So, the industry need came up, we're able to respond, but the only reason we can do this is because we did all this other stuff. And when we did this stuff, it had no industrial relevance. Angela, just, she's just so anxious to come up here, I don't know what it's all about. So what I've given you is a case for balance. I hope I've been clear about this. I'm not saying you only support this exploration research. I'm not saying anything like that. We have a need sometimes for environment research that has no industrial application that's direct. We have a need for industry and society. We have a responsibility and an opportunity to respond to industry needs. We always have to generate evidence, knowledge, and technology, but what we need is balance. And now we, Angela's been waiting. I'm sorry, <laughs> Chancellor Merkel. She is the world's most powerful scientist. I looked it up. Forbes magazine says she's the fifth most powerful person in the world. I don't like this woman thing, but number one woman, but the fact is I checked the other four aren't scientists, so she is the world's most powerful scientist. And she came to Dalhousie. Thanks very much to Martha Crago for her instrumental role in, in bringing that meeting about. 
and she came to talk science. It was a remarkable experience for all of us. She came to Dalhousie to talk science. And she talked to Doug Wallace about uh, his ocean exploration, Sarah Iverson about the ocean tracking network. She talked to graduate students. It, it was a wonderful experience. We all got a great deal out of it. And I got to talk to her a little bit about ballast water, and this is it, you know, five minutes with Angela Merkel to make your point. So I'll tell you the first thing that happened was she asked me, and this is real interesting, a leader of a country and a leader in Europe, her question was, what do you think about the scientific ba basis for regulations on ballast water treatment? Give me your scientific opinion of that. that. That was just remarkable. You think it's normal, but it was just such a pleasure to have a leader say, tell me what you think as an expert. It was great. So I was chuffed about that, but then I've got my five minutes walking down the hallway to give her my pitch, and what I gave her was a pitch I just gave you. I said, Exploration research is the fuel of the innovation engine. I'm going, nah, nah, nah. I said, look, we did ozone hole and fluorescence and remote sensing, and, and that is the reason we could help industry on the supply problem, da, 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 da. And I was just, I said, man, I've made my case, right? So there was her reaction. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a simulation. I can't tell you the exact words, but I can tell you the exact sentiment. She gave me this very nice, polite look, and she said, but anyone knows that. But anyone knows that. So it's a case for balance. But I talked to you about industry innovation. I talked to you about some local issues and things that have been really good for Nova Scotia. But there is a stronger case for the science of how things work. There really is. And I think Ford Doolittle, Dalhousie, honored with the Hertzberg Award recently, fellow of the Royal Society and many other honors. This is a quote from him. Understanding the world is one of the more serious obligations of our species. And I think sometimes we just have to take a step back and think about that, because we have so many immediate needs. We really do. We've got a lot of things on our plate, but you know, we've got one big thing on our plate too. And that's what I'll end with. What's the use of that? Sorry, one earth. And that's the use of it. Thank you very much. <laughs>